Let's open our Bibles tonight to the New Testament book of Philippians, chapter 3. The Christian mind. What kind of mind are we supposed to have as Christians? We're going to see three types of uh, minds that we ought to have. The mind that focuses on Christ, the mind that reaches for Christ, and the mind that waits for Christ. The Christian mind should focus on, reach for, and wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. As always, let's ask for his help. Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to understand it and really be changed by it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul is writing from a Roman prison, chained to Roman soldiers, and it's a book of joy. It's a book of freedom in spite of his circumstances. And he wants for us to have the right kind of mindset. Oh, there are many different kinds of mindsets in this world, but as Christians, we ought to have that mindset that is focused on Jesus Christ, first of all. Uh, we'll begin with verse 1 in chapter 3. Uh, as we focus on Christ, we ought to enjoy Him, we ought to trust Him, and we ought to know Him. Let's look at the first 11 verses as we focus in on Jesus Christ. First of all, enjoy Him. Secondly, trust Him. Thirdly, know Him. Finally, my brethren, and oh, by the way, the word finally for the Apostle Paul, you know what that means? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. It's like the story of the mother taking the child to the service for the first time. There's the pastor behind the pulpit, and the kid has all sorts of questions about the choir and about the people and here and there. And then she says, what is he doing? He takes his watch out and begins to wind it. And the little girl says to the mother, what does that mean? And she said, honey, when the pastor winds his watch, it means absolutely nothing, okay? So the same thing with Paul. Finally means I'm just going to keep talking. Uh, same thing with us. One more thing. What does that mean? Absolutely nothing. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. That word rejoice is so important. It means to enjoy Him. It doesn't mean that we're going to be happy about circumstances when they go bad, but our inner joy is always focused on Jesus because he never changes. And no matter what happens with happenings, he is going to bless us and things are going to work together for our good. So we're not rejoicing in circumstances, we are rejoicing in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it's safe. So I've said this before, but it's safe to say it again. Kids say to their parents, oh, don't tell me that again. You say that all the time, mother. I've heard it before, father. No, it's important to say it again and again and again. Now he's warning them, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So he's saying, I want you to enjoy the Lord, and I want you to watch out for dogs. Not talking about puppy dogs. We're talking about scavenger, wild dogs who would roam the streets looking for food and could be dangerous. Uh, but he's not talking about dogs. He's talking about Judaizers. These were so-called Christians who were trying to tell the Gentiles they had to become Christian, had to become Jews to be saved. These were Jewish supposedly Christians, saying that for you Gentiles to be saved, you have to be circumcised. You've got to keep the law of Moses. In other words, a law of works. He's saying they're actually evil workers, and watch out for the mutilation. Talking about the circumcision, which is the operation of the, of the extra flesh on the male penis on the eighth day, he's saying they're not going to be working just with the circumcision. They want to mutilate you altogether, cut off your walk with the Lord. So watch out for the circumcision uh, from them. That's not really circumcision, but mutilation. But he says, for us, we are the circumcision as we worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So what's the connection with circumcision? Who was the first one to be given the commandment of circumcision? It was Abraham, wasn't it? 
God told Abraham to be circumcised, to to circumcise his children, Isaac and Ishmael. Oh yes, the Arabs also believe in circumcision as they are descended from Ishmael, but the Jews certainly do. And as that circumcision was performed, that cutting away of the flesh was symbolic of cutting away the fleshly side of our heart, the fleshly side of our lives, the part where we're looking to sin and do that which is evil as far as the Lord's concerned. So circumcision, uh, the Lord talks about a circumcised heart. We could talk about a circumcised eye or hand, one that is not dealing with the flesh, but in the spirit. So we are the true circumcision, those who have cut away the fleshly side of our lives as we worship God in the spirit worshiping the Lord in the Holy Spirit through our spiritual nature as we're rejoicing in Christ Jesus and we're not trusting in fleshly rituals such as circumcision, such as prayers, such as lighting of candles, such as no, this, all these different observances which are not going to bring us into a relationship with God through salvation. That's only by faith in Christ. Now he says, now going on in verse 4, through eight, not only are you to enjoy the Lord, you are to trust him. Verses four through eight, we need to trust the Lord Jesus. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what, these th- what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So the problem he was facing was that as he had come to the Philippian church and brought them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, telling them that by grace you're saved, not by works, they understood that message. And then after he left, Jews came in who purported to be Christians, and they said, now you've received Jesus Christ, but you've also got to be circumcised, you've got to keep the law of Moses. And uh, he's already said to them they're actually dogs, and they are uh, evil workers, and they're trying to cut off your relationship with the Lord by binding you with works instead of faith. And he says, you know, they, they brag about the fact that they're Jews, that they've got a long pedigree. And I'm going to tell you something. If we have to brag in terms of Judaism before Christ and even after Christ, look at my credentials, look at my resume. And so he has to bring out reluctantly his credentials. Verse 4, um, if I, I was going to trust in my fleshly accomplishments, I might have confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has confidence in the flesh, I more so. So these Jews coming in saying that they are from, from headquarters, that they know James and uh, in the, the council, and they are Jews and they're Pharisees, Whatever their credentials are, if you want to lay mine against theirs, I come out on top. I was, first of all, like all Jewish males, verse 5, circumcised the eighth day. God required it to be the eighth day. Interesting that God understands physical anatomy. Doctors will not perform an operation, nor will the rabbis, on the seventh day. Why? Coagulation of blood. Too soon the child could bleed to death. Eighth day is perfect. Ninth day, tenth day, the longer you wait, the more painful it is. Eighth day is the perfect day for circumcision. I was circumcised on the eighth day, he says. I was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I excelled them all. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee, a student of the law. I really knew the law. Concerning zeal, as far as being zealous, I persecuted the church. I arrested many people who were then, in some cases, put to death. I was responsible for heading up to Damascus to arrest Christians when I was caught by the Lord and apprehended and brought to him. And concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. As far as keeping the law, I did everything I was supposed to do. If I could be made righteous by keeping the law, I was the man. 
But he says, I'm not really bragging because none of that means anything. What really means something is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse 7, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss of Christ, uh, for Christ. I have accomplished all these things, went through the highest level of education. And this man was incredibly educated. He sat at the feet of the finest rabbi of that time, Gamaliel, who was on the Sanhedrin. Gamaliel said he was the most brilliant student he ever had. His problem was to keep Paul in, in books and parchments. He was a, a voracious reader, an incredible mind, far more educated than Jesus, Peter, James, John. Those were simple men who had a basic knowledge of Scripture. Of course, Jesus as God also was the author of the Word of God. But humanly speaking, he didn't have the education level that the Apostle Paul had. But Paul said, it's not about that. It's about Jesus Christ. And so he says in verse 8, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I'd give it all up if I had to, as long as I know Jesus Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I have taken Jesus Christ around the world, and I have suffered even as I am right now in prison. I've been beaten. I've had all sorts of problems there, but I suffer that for the cause of Christ. I count whatever I've done as rubbish. Nice fancy word for dung. I count it all as garbage uh, that I might gain Christ. All that I've done, my degrees, my education, my ethnic background, uh, all the things that were done ritualistically uh, right means nothing unless you know Christ. And that's a good lesson for us as well. Nothing wrong with education. And if the Lord calls you to a higher level of education, then that's great. But use it humbly as a servant to bless others not to be bragging. And he's not bragging here. What he's really saying is that others are coming in here and saying they have more than I, so listen to them. I have more than they, so forget them and just forget me and look at Jesus Christ. So that's important for us as well. Again, let's not look down upon or look up at those who have advanced whatevers. There are people that have all sorts of degrees and uh, who will uh, try to impress you with that. Well, I've got a... a advanced education and religion, or I served in this ministry or that. Well, that's great. Praise God. If you did it for the Lord and for people, beautiful. But don't brag about it. The important thing is, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And uh, that's a, uh, a message that uh, is important for us to share with others. And also, don't be put off. Um, in the early days of our ministry, we had several of us who... Um, all came after the same individual. Uh, one was the bishop of the Catholic Church, and one of our fellows said to him, do you really know Jesus Christ? And uh, he said, I believe I do, but he said, may I lead you in a sinner's prayer? And he did lead the bishop into a sinner's prayer. Now, whether that bishop was saved at that moment or knew him before, we don't know. But don't always assume because a person has a certain position that he knows the Lord. We also, all three of us independently, went after, without knowing about the other one, the mayor, the longest tenured mayor of a major city in the history of, of the United States. And uh, before he died, we had a chance to lead him to Christ. He was a very prominent member of a very prominent church. I didn't care about that. I thought the Lord said, talk to him about Jesus, talk to him about the Lord. It does hurt when your wife says to you, and you're the pastor of the church, honey, do you know the Lord? That's what you need to find out, what's going on here? But uh, once Kelly made a comment like that, do you know the Lord? And I said, honey, at least I'm putting up a good show by being in the pulpit, pretending I do, let's go along with it. Of course I know the Lord. But the important thing is to not rely upon credentials. The important thing is, do you know Jesus? All right? And then he says now, beginning in verse 9, your, your trust is in him, not in your education or your background or your ethnicity or the fact that your grandmother was a Christian. You need to know him personally. Look at verses 9 through 11. I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Know him. That's the goal. Look at verse 9. I want to be found in him. 
That means that when he comes, I'm in him. When you look at me today, I am in him. Not in the flesh, although we have fleshly moments, but we really are his. We belong to him. I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, not my own good works, not the fact that I'm going to get to heaven based on my own good standards and work ethics, but not my righteousness. That's all from the law, just trying to keep the law and trying to get to heaven by keeping the law. But that which is through faith in Christ, that's the righteousness that I want. The faith, the trust in him that he is the righteous one, not me. He has satisfied God. I can't satisfy the Lord, but he can, and he has done it. And my faith or trust is in him. That's the righteousness that God has. The righteousness which is from God by faith. By grace you have been saved through faith he writes to the Ephesian church, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We're trusting in Christ, not our good works. And it's a very easy thing to find out when you talk to somebody, if you get a chance to talk about the Lord and you get a chance to talk about salvation, you might ask the question that was once asked by what the great teacher Donald Gray Barnhouse back in the 1950s, pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church. He was on the radio daily, he would always ask the same question at the end of his radio program. If you were to die today and you were to go to heaven and knock on the gate and God said, why should I let you come into my heaven? What would you say? On what basis can you go to heaven? My good works? I've been a good person. I paid my tithes. I prayed. I helped uh, little old ladies across the street. Whatever. Not good enough. If you die tonight, do you know for a certainty you'd go to heaven? And based on what? And there's only one answer. By faith in Jesus Christ. My trust in him. And so he says that's what we need to do. Verse 10, I want to know him. The word know in the Greek is the word gnosko. It means to know personally. I know President Obama and President-elect Donald Trump. I know them by the fact that I'm aware of who they are. I've read about them and I've seen them on television. Do I know them personally? No, I don't. Gnosko, my wife, the children, I know them personally. You, I know personally. The important thing is, do you know the Lord? Not just that he's Lord, not just that he exists, that he died for our sins. Do you know him and do you know him personally? And more importantly, do you know him intimately? Not do you know about him, do you really know him? That's what I want, verse 10. That I may know him and also the power of his resurrection. Not just the power that raised him from the dead, the power that's going to raise me from the dead. But then what about today when I'm in a funk because of some problem in my life and I think there's no hope? What about the power of his resurrection? Where's my understanding of that power of the resurrection that can raise me out of this case of depression and fear and concern into the level of trusting in him and rejoicing in him? So the power of the resurrection is not just the power that raised him or the power that's going to raise us, but the power that's going to raise us right now into the heavenly places to trust him and to act like Christians who believe that the victory has already been won. So Lord, we want to know you, we want to know the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Ooh, I like the power of the resurrection, but the fellowship of your sufferings, that's part of it. My wife and I stood at the altar here a couple of years ago, a little over two years ago. We had to make vows for better or for worse, sickness and in health. And so it means the whole we used to say Gonza Megillah when I was a kid. The whole deal. Uh, Lord, I want to be with you for your power, but not your sufferings. I want the crown, but not the cross. No, the Lord says, you want the crown? You pick up your own cross and you follow me. So Lord, I need to know you in the fellowship of your sufferings. But even as I know you in the fellowship of the sufferings, I need to remember the power of your resurrection. All right, I'm going through suffering. I'm going through a problem physically or emotionally, or legally, or financially, or in a relationship. All right, I'm going to have to go through this looking to you and remember your power, 
not just the suffering, but the resurrection power of the Lord, that all things are going to be working for good. We need to have that balance in our lives. So verse 10 is really the key to a successful life. You got to know him, you have to know his power, be willing to fellowship with him in the sufferings, and then even to be conformed to his death. Going through suffering is one thing. Dying to yourself is another. Jesus suffered on the cross with his hands and his, his feet being nailed to the cross, and then he died. You and I go through sufferings for the cause of Christ, but then we have to be able to die. Die to ourselves and allow his resurrection power to come forth. Paul said, I die daily. Lord, help me to die to self, die to my ambitions, my timetable, my desires, and be raised in resurrection power. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, that this all may end up with my arriving at the resurrection of the dead, being brought into your kingdom before the judgment seat of Christ itself. This is a tremendous passage here about focusing on Christ. That's the Christian mind. And oh, the devil gets in there and tries to get us to be afraid, and the old nature gets in there and tries to get us to be depressed. We've got to keep coming back and being focused on the Lord. Lord, verse 10, I want to know you. I want to know the power of that resurrection that you have for me, not just in the future, but right now. And I want to be able to go through these sufferings with class, being able to point people to you and know that one day I will be around your throne, conform to your death. And actually conform to your death now and one day actually be raised from the dead in heaven. All right, that's the uh, focus. How about the reach? Reach for Christ. We need to press on. We need to see the prize. We need to stay committed. This is kind of an analogy for running track, uh, a race. How many of you ever ran track? Ever, ever run track? Okay, long distances, short distances? Both? Wow. Okay. Let's see how this plays out. Would this be good counsel for a track, uh, a track person? Not that I have already attained. In other words, I haven't attained uh, to perfection. Uh, I haven't attained to the throne yet. I'm still a work in progress. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected. I'm not, I haven't reached the goal yet. I still have sin. I still have struggles. I'm not perfect. But I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended or laid hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be the same of the same mind. So does that work out in terms of running a race in track? How about life? How about anything that we have to do? Pressing toward the goal, not giving up. That's the key to the Christian walk. That's the part that the devil can't possibly defeat. Oh, he can knock us down, but we come right back up again. I've talked about my favorite friend when I was a young little boy. Not mom, not dad, not brother, not my two sisters. My little clown. I had a little uh, rubber clown and we'd blow him up, and he'd stand up and smile at me, and then I'd punch him, and he'd go down. He'd come right back up again. And I'd punch him again. He'd go down and come right back up again. And more than once, the Lord said, be like that little clown. Just keep popping right back up again. The devil may knock you down, but you get up the next day, and you keep on going. So let's see how verse 12 leads us into this reaching for Christ. Again, think about a, a track star or just a, a, a long-distance runner or an athlete of any sort. But here the image is definitely uh, in terms of track and field. Not that I've already attained. So here you are, you're at the starting block or you're halfway along the course of your 100-yard dash or your quarter mile or your 
uh, your uh, country, you got long distance uh, uh, running, and you haven't gotten there yet, but you're on the way. I'm not perfected. I haven't crossed the finish line, but I press on. Even if I'm not the first, uh, there, there are those in front of me, I'm going to keep pressing on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. I want to get to the finish line. I'm not competing against other runners, other Christians. I'm just running to run the race, to be able to get to the finish line, to hear the well done from the Lord Jesus, receive the crown of life, and that's why he laid hold of me. So you ran track in school. So the coach laid hold of you, said, I want you to run out for the team. I want you to do this event. He laid hold of you or brought you onto the team for a certain purpose. You need to fulfill it. The Lord brought you onto the team for a certain purpose, a certain ministry. We need to fulfill it. So he laid hold of us. We need to lay hold of that victory. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have already laid hold of it. But one thing I do, and here's the key, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Every person who ran track, every young boy and girl has been told by the coach, do your best, but under no circumstances, look behind you. I don't care if you hear a herd of buffalo behind you, don't look back. You do, you're going to miss a step, which could be the one step for victory. Don't look back. Don't look at the bleachers, at your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Look forward at the goal. Keep your eyes on the goal. So he says, uh, verse 14, I press. That means to give everything you possibly can. You see those runners, especially in the 100 meters or 100 yards, they are absolutely uh, pushing themselves. In fact, at the last Olympics, there was a real questionable call where one young lady, uh, I think it was a 100 meter run, pressed so much she deliberately threw herself headlong, landing first uh, over the finish line, flat on her face, but she won. Question of was that really ethical? That's pressing a little bit too much, if some people thought, but that's what she wanted to do. She wanted to cross first, so she threw herself ahead and nosed out two other runners. I pressed toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I want to be called up by Him. I want the well done, good and faithful servant. That's why I'm doing all I can to cross that finish line. Therefore, verse 15, let us as many as are mature have this mind. We're talking about the mind of the Christian. Let's be mature. Let's not be childish. Let's not be babies. Let's have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. You disagree with me? Oh, God's going to let you know about that. He'll straighten you out, even if I can't. The late J. Vernon McGee used to say on his verse-by-verse teaching radio program, he's still on the radio. After all the others come and go, he's still on there. He's been dead for many, many years. But he likes to say this, here's my opinion on this, and if you disagree with me, you're entitled to do that. But on the way up in the rapture, you'll find out that I was right all along. So we can say the same thing too. We can disagree, but in heaven you'll realize I was right. And that's what he's saying here is that God's going to reveal to you here or hereafter that what I'm saying is true. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained or we've held on to that and gotten a hold of part of what God has for us, so to that degree, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. So we are running that race. And we have, cut, let's say you're running a 100 meter race and you've gone 50 meters, you've gone halfway. Hold on to that. That's progress. You're not finished, but you hold on to that. And then he says, as far as this, he now goes into a different analogy. Let's walk by the same rule. Um, and that, that means uh, to be in line with everybody else. So now he kind of shifts to a military analogy. How many were ever in, a, in the military or in some kind of a, a drill where you had to have guns and you had to be lined up? Okay, uh, there's a, there are two things you have to do in order, when you see a column, let's say you see a company going down the street or a platoon, um, 
What do you have to do? You've got three across and you've got eight or ten deep. Uh, how do you keep them all together? Each person has only two things to do. You line yourself up on the person in front of you, get right behind them, and then look to your right and make sure that you're parallel to the rest of them there. Don't look to the left and don't look to the back. Just look forward and to the right. And if they all do that right, it's absolutely perfect. So the thing we do here is we look to the Lord Jesus, but also look to each other to make sure that we're all in line. Now, we're not looking to each other to be our example. That's Christ. But my wife and I need to be in line. We need to look at each other. We need to make sure that we're uh, a parallel. We're on the same page. And if we're not, we need to come together. And during the course of the day, there can be many circumstances that can try to get us out of alignment. We need to pray. We need to talk. We need to communicate. We need to bless. We need to apologize. We need to do all that we can to make sure that we are in line with each other. Otherwise, we're going to have trouble. And that goes with kids and grandkids and people at work as well. You got to get in line. And so even at the job, the school teacher, what have you, is going to say, get in line. You're out of line. And uh, we need to be marching together in lockstep. Now, finally, he says, he talked about focusing on Christ, talks about reaching for Christ. Now he says, and sometimes this is the hard part, wait for Christ. We've got to wait for Him. It means to follow those who are godly, avoid those who are ungodly, and look for Jesus. Verse 17, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Our citizenship is in heaven, not here. Not here on earth. Oh, we may be a naturalized citizen, or you may be, uh, when you've been born in this country, that's fine. But our real citizenship is in heaven. We need to remember that we're just passing through. So verse 17, he says, I want you to follow those who are godly. Join in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Not just me, but look at Timothy, look at Titus, look at Silas and the others. We serve the Lord, and I want you to follow our example as we follow Christ. Keeping your eyes on Him, but again, we're part of a family and a team. We need to all work together. And so it's important in our family, my wife tries the best she can to be a good example for the kids. I try as well, but she does a better job for sure. And uh, as their naturalized mother and grandmother, they, she's the one that they look to. Um, and she wants to set an example for them. They get up in the morning and they come down with the grandkids and she's reading the word of God, she's praying, she's praying over them, and they're learning how to start the day. Start the day with the Lord, with the word of God, not with some cartoon. And uh, so follow those who are walking with the Lord. Be uh, an example for other people to follow you. Verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So avoid the ungodly. He already talked about these Judaizers who were coming in trying to make Gentiles Jews. Uh, those who are not serving the Lord, not following the Lord. So don't follow those who are not following Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 19, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. All they care about is eating, making money, feeding their habits, their lusts, whose glory is in their shame. They're actually shaming themselves and they think that they're actually glorious because of it. They're proud of things they really shouldn't be proud of. Who have set their mind on earthly things. There's the problem. Earthly meaning fleshly things. 
Their mind is on things of the flesh, things of sin, things of the old nature. But not us, he says in verse 20. We are of a different citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our home is heaven. We're looking to the Lord. We're looking for Him to come. We're looking for Him at any moment. And we must live in that expectation. When I first came to the Lord back in the late 70s, they used to have a fellow on the uh, radio who always ended his program with, keep looking up, he said. Keep looking up. And uh, I thought, well, you've got to keep your eyes on the ground unless you fall through a manhole. But uh, I got the idea there. You need to keep looking up. Look up to Jesus. Look up to heaven. Lord, I- I'm looking at self. I'm looking at the, the, the ground. I'm looking at sin. I'm looking at problems. I need to look up because that's where the Lord's coming from. And that's where our strength comes from. And he will transform our lowly body, that's these physical bodies, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. He's going to give us resurrection bodies. Can you believe that? Sinless, perfect resurrection bodies. They won't need to sleep. There'll be no sleep, no night. They can eat. That's the good news. I love to eat. I'm sure you do too. These bodies are going to be able to just probably pass through walls. Please knock on my door in heaven. Don't just pass through the wall. But uh, they'll be wonderful bodies. They'll be able to go from here to there in a moment's time. As you're here in the millennium on your resurrection body and the Lord says, come to Jerusalem, you're just going to think it and you're going to be there. You don't need to wait for El Al or some airline to, to take you through the uh, security screening situation. Just, just be there. And so he says, uh, and that's the same thing for us now. These are not resurrection bodies in that sense, but Christ lives in us. And if he says, be with me, just be there. You're a prayer away. You're a thought away. Lord, I'm with you. I'm in this horrible circumstance, but spiritually, I am with you. And as you think it and you pray it, you're there. So he says, he'll transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. He is able to do that. He can subdue all things. What is our problem? We got a problem physically? Got a problem with finances? Got a problem with enemies? Got a problem with relationships? He is able to subdue all things to himself. Give it to him. Stop carrying it. Stop trying to struggle with it. Lord, I give it to you, and I want you to take care of it. I'm just going to know that you can handle this. I don't know how you're going to handle it, but it's going to be right. I'm not going to struggle with this thing anymore. I've tried the best I can. I'm getting nowhere. I'm getting frustrated. I'm digging myself into a deeper hole. Here it is, Lord. Take it. Subdue it unto yourself. The great battleground is the mind. We know that. Got to get your mind on Christ. Get your mind off self. Get your mind off the world. Get your mind off the devil. How do you do it? You focus on him. You reach for him. You wait for him. And then the lesson here is from Hebrews 12. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this fabulous chapter, chapter 3 of the book of Philippians, talking about the Christian mind. Help us to focus on you, Lord. Help us to reach for you. Help us to wait for you. Lord Jesus, come into our hearts, live your life in us. We confess our sins. We ask you to forgive us. We ask you to help us now to run the race for the glory of God, looking unto you, Jesus. In your name, amen and amen.